great and glorious Heavenly Father, we come together as the body of Christ, gathered believers who are your children, your sons and daughters, but your one and only unique Son who came to die for us. We celebrate His coming during this season. Lord, we celebrate it every day that Christ gave up His life and took our punishment so that we might be set free and have eternal life in Him. We celebrate this every day as we should, but this time of year, we do a little bit more. And we pray, Lord, that everything we do here today would honor you and bring you glory and praise and worship. That, Lord, our worship was offered up to you in spirit and in truth and was pleasing to you. We pray now for the preaching of your word, that it would be a word that you have sent to us, your people, delivered by the under-shepherd. Lord, bless the preaching of your word that it might be received the way you intend it to be, might minister to each of us in ways that we need, and bring glory to yourself. I also pray for those that might be among us who don't know you, they have not come to you through Christ, they are curious maybe or interested, I pray that this day would be the day of salvation, that your Holy Spirit would move upon us and within us, and Lord, cause us to be on fire for you, for the time is short. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Welcome, glad to see all of you here. We'll get started on the message shortly, but I want to make sure we got all our little uh, extras done. You got a list of things in your bulletin. If you didn't get a bulletin, you can raise your hand, and I'm sure Fred will get you one. Um, we have lots of things going on, but there's a couple of things I just want to uh, bring up. First of all, we haven't been saying a lot about COVID lately, and it's been kind of nice, hasn't it? <laughs> but we need to remember that it is in our community, and if, obviously I'm not going to make anybody do anything because you're all grown-ups here, but if you're not vaccinated, it might be a good idea to, to wear a mask when you're in here. Your choice, but it might be a good idea. I just don't want to see anybody sick. You know, we haven't had any cases. I mean, we've been blessed. God has protected us. And, uh, and I like to keep it that way. So just think about that. And um, our big dinner is Wednesday night. I believe it starts at 5. If you haven't gotten on the reservation list thingy out there, then, then please do. And if you want to participate in the, uh, what do you call it, Yankee Swap, uh, then you need to bring a little crazy gift. I don't know. I just drew a blank. Yankee Swap. It's, it's fun. I, I, first one I ever went to was years ago here, and I haven't seen so much laughing in a long time. So... Anyway, we continue on with our preaching series through the Gospel of John. Uh, today is the 21st sermon. Uh, there's going to be a lot more, and hopefully we'll finish up right about the time uh, Easter comes next year, and we'll be kind of in sync with that part of the Gospel of John. So if you're not already in chapter 10, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be reading in a moment the first 21 verses. And if I seem a little off, it's because my right hearing aid has been sent off for repair. And if you wear hearing aids, you know, if one's not there, you just feel internally a little bit out of balance. And I don't know. So I'll survive. It should be back tomorrow or Tuesday. So the title of today's lesson is, I Am the Good Shepherd. From uh, 1984 to 1988, I was an instructor at the Air Force Logistics Command's Non-Commissioned Officers Leadership School in uh, Hill Air Force Base, Utah. It's a school where mid-level NCOs, supervisors of the lower ranks, would attend in residence for four weeks. Uh, our curriculum was in four categories, world affairs, communication skills, military skills, and leadership and management. This last category was designed to prepare them for higher leadership positions as they gained rank. 
in the textbook that we wrote for the subject, we had to come up with a working definition of the word leadership. There's a lot of definitions out there. This is the one we picked. Leadership is the art of influencing and directing people in a way that will win their obedience, confidence, respect, and loyal cooperation in achieving a common goal. Now, I understand that leadership in a military context is quite different from leadership in a religious arena. Uh, I was a master sergeant then, but I'm a pastor now. Ralph Hicks was a plant manager, but now he's a deacon. Uh, Ken was a milkman, but now he's a deacon. I'll leave Dave and Bill alone since they don't appear to be here. But let me, let me reread that, and I want you to listen to this definition, again, in a, in a religious context of leadership. Leadership is the art of influencing, the art of influencing and directing people in a way that will win their obedience, confidence, respect, and loyal cooperation in achieving a common goal. I think this definition generally applies to most leadership contexts. So what does this have to do with anything? In today's text, from the Gospel of John, Jesus is coming down hard on the Jewish religious leaders for being bad leaders, or as he puts it, false shepherds. This they are. Their one style of leadership might be called authoritarian. The people feared their pastors. Can you imagine that? The pastors were corrupt, and they distorted God's word to benefit themselves. And that was a situation Jesus could not ignore. I've seen <clears throat> both good and bad leaders in the military, in the business world, and in churches. And I'm sure most of you have too. But we can celebrate that no matter what the situation, Jesus is our good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd over his flock, the church, which is us. If we always remember who the boss is, we'll stay out of trouble. When Alexander the Great conquered much of the ancient Near East in the 4th century B.C., including Israel, he enforced a cultural change on the region. Greek language and culture would dominate and become the norm. Even the Jews were assimilated into the Greek way of life. Within 150 years, Israel had adopted numerous Greek cultural and religious habits. Even the Bible was translated into Greek for Jews who had forgotten how to read Hebrew. Now, some of the Jews resisted this cultural domination. They were called the Hasidim, and they met opposition not only from the Greeks, but also from Jews who had compromised their commitment to Jewish culture and religion. Some of the priests, the Jewish priests, were corrupt and contributed to the demise of Jewish temple worship. The Greek soldiers desecrated the temple with pig's blood, outlawed Jewish rituals like circumcision, burned scripture scrolls, and even erected a pagan idol in the temple. In the 160s BC, the Maccabean War erupted, pitting conservative Jewish fighters against the Greeks and Jews who had adopted Greek ways. His first, their first leader, Judas Maccabeus, captured Jerusalem's temple and in 165 B.C. rededicated it. Hanukkah is a Hebrew word meaning dedication, and it became the name of the winter festival that remembered these events. In the first century, it was celebrated for eight days, recalling the eight miraculous days, the oil in the temple lamps, kept burning without needing to be refilled. Hanukkah became a season that asked hard questions about failed leadership and false shepherds. By the way, Hanukkah just ended six days ago. How did the temple leadership lose its way during this Greek period? Where were the shepherds? What lessons are in this for shepherds today? Now, chapter 9, we finished last week, closed with a word of judgment from Jesus 
on the Pharisees for their spiritual blindness. Chapter 10 now continues in that same vein, and we're about to read a parable that Jesus used to identify the Pharisees as false leaders of Israel. In chapter 11, in a couple of weeks, we'll see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, and that sent the Jewish religious leadership over the edge, and they began to solidify their plan to kill him. If you have an outline, we gave them out a while back, and I'm sorry I forgot to make copies, an outline of the Gospel of John that we handed out a while back, we are at F2 in that process. I'm going to read now the first 21 verses of the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but, if the, but the sheep did not listen to, to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own is the Father of me, and the Father. I lay down my life. That are not of this fold. I bring them all my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is opp oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Father, I know for some of us it may be hard to understand sometimes the context of Scripture. We uh, probably none of us were raised to uh, raising sheep or cattle. But Lord, there's some good lessons in this and there's some good figures of speech that mean important things. And I pray that you would open our minds to those. Help us to understand what it is that's going on here so that it might not just bless us and help us, but Lord, make us more like Jesus. Because that's the goal for all of us. And I pray for this message and I pray for every person here that it would be effective. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was to summarize this passage, I would just very simply say, Jesus is the good shepherd, as he says it a few times, who saves and cares for all who are truly his. <clears throat> Three things I want to tell you about this. And the first is not just taken from this passage, but it's taken from some other places in the Bible. First idea is that Jesus is the chief shepherd or pastor of the church, but he delegates authority to the ones he calls to shepherd or pastor particular churches. Verse 11, he talked about he was, loved it so much he was willing to die. He's talking about his sheep, but of course that's a metaphor for those who have come to believe in Christ. 
And we know, because we know the whole story later on, he did die for his sheep to pay for their sins. Uh, and he talks a little bit about this hired hand here. And <clears throat> I, I like to use that as the opposite of what a shepherd ought to be, clearly. Because the hired hand, when he sees the wolf coming, he takes off. He's not going to lose his life, potentially, to protect somebody else's sheep. Whereas the contrast is that if a, a real shepherd, a called shepherd of God, is going to do whatever it takes, even die, to protect his flock. And I see that today applicable more in a spiritual sense than a physical one. Well, yeah, physically, I, if you needed me to help defend you, I'd try to. Uh, but I'm an old man now, and I can't fight like I used to. But um, spiritually, your shepherds protect you through their prayers for you. I pray for all of you for, through the preaching and teaching of God's Word, through the fellowship, through all the things that we do here as part of Christian discipleship. But this brings up a good question about qualifications to be a shepherd. If you'd rather me use the word pastor, then it's the same thing. Qualifications to be a shepherd. Well, first of all, you can go to Titus chapter 1, and you can see right there some of the qualifications. It must be a husband of one man, one woman, that kind of thing. But this is some other things that we pull out of this passage. We see that a good shepherd, we see whether what they say and do coheres with the work and witness of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying your pastor needs to look like and be just like Jesus because he made us all different. But your shepherd, and I, I'm going to include deacons in this, okay, because they're set aside for service to God's people. We should be working in our lives continually to better ourselves, becoming more like Christ. This is something we all should be pursuing, but especially those that God has called to be shepherds over his church. Shepherds must also speak honestly, though compassionately, to the people of God about their lives. Who do they follow? What voices do they recognize? Where do they go for shelter? To whom do you turn in crisis? So in a sense, the shepherd, just like he defends his sheep, do you know I learned something? Shepherds in those days, they always carried a, uh, what do you call it, slingshot? And they were experts with it. So if a wolf was coming along, he could take care of it. Uh, so protecting the flock in this sense would be guarding you against false teaching, guarding you against false teachers, helping you to identify and discern what, a, what the truth is rather than something bad. We need to learn how to discern between good and bad shepherds. A lot of you have been in churches long enough, you've probably run into some, a few shepherds that were not so great. Ralph's told me some stories, but, you know, on the one side, yeah, we're all human beings, and we're, we have flaws, and we make mistakes, but probably one of the most important decisions a church can ever make is who to hire to be their shepherd. So we'll talk in more detail about that another time, but here's some signs of a bad shepherd. Any voice, any shepherd who draws people away from God and inflicts any kind of harm on them is a bad shepherd. We've probably seen or heard stories of self-centered, bullying, lazy, unteachable shepherds. And hopefully the church, should it make the mistake of hiring one, would not have them around for very long couple of quotes from scripture about what God thinks about shepherds. When I read this stuff, it, it scares me a little bit, Ralph. And you'll see why in just a minute. The word of the Lord came to me in Ezekiel chapter 34. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. Back then they weren't worried about cholesterol. They ate the fat because it had all the flavor in it. All right? It does. You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. 
The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. Force and harshness. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains. And on every high hill, my sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God. Surely, because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds, Hear the word of the Lord. I can imagine Ezekiel saying it just like that. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they be not food for them. These were some bad shepherds shepherding Israel. Jeremiah, he agrees. He says, Woe to the shepherds destroy and scatter the sheep in my pasture. Remember the sheep here. It's a metaphor for God's people. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock. That speaks to church division. And have driven them away. That's people who leave the church because of bad pastors. And you have not attended to them. And these bad pastors have made no effort to get them back. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. This is prophesying into the future. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. That could go on. I mean, I'm not. The, the shepherds of Israel at the time of the prophets were corrupt. They were involved in things that they should never have been involved in. And so God was giving his judgment. So selecting a pastor or a deacon is an important decision for a church. Conformity to Christ and his teachings is of utmost importance. But that's all for all of us. That's not just for shepherds. So a second point is Jesus knows his true followers and genuine Christians know him. You see in verse 1, and then later on he does it again, truly, truly, that's a double amen. That means what Jesus is about to say has special significance for his audience. In other words, I've been telling you good things, but you better listen to this right now. So verse 1, truly, truly, I say to you, he, he, all right, he's talking about somebody breaking into the sheepfold here. What would you do if somebody started breaking into your house? Some of you'd shoot them, and you'd be legally right, I guess. But why? Because that's not the way to get into your house, is it? It's not the right way. If, you were, if I went over to your house, Chase, I need to go knock on the door, because I know you shoot me if I try to crawl through the window. <laughs> so this is God, Jesus, Jesus is making a, a, a parable, some call it, of a false shepherd trying to get to the sheep. Now, what do you think the intent of the false shepherd is in this metaphor, okay? You think he wants to steal some sheep? Yeah, he's a bandit, probably. He wants to take it to the market and sell it. Or maybe he's really hungry and he just wants to grab one and take it home and eat it. Either way, it's theft. Then he contrasts that guy with the guy who comes to the door, comes through the gate. There's a century in many cases. Somebody guarding the gate at night. This is nighttime. This is where they store the sheep when they're not out in the field. And because the sentry recognizes that this guy is the true shepherd, he's allowed to go right home through the door or to call his sheep. And you know what's really funny? I love when I research these things and I learn crazy stuff. Well, first of all, the sheep pens, if they were at a, a, a shepherd's house, then it would be probably attached to the house in some way, but it would be a, a, a rock wall all the way around it, three or four feet high, and at night the sheep would be kept in there, and there would be a gate. Uh, if it was out in the fields, then it would, it would back up to a cliff, or it would be in the, at the end of a, uh, a canyon. It would build a wall, 
so the sheep would be safe. They had a lot of wild animals in those days in, in the Middle East that could go after these sheep. And this was valuable stuff. And these shepherds, they loved their sheep. They had names for some of them. I don't know where the researcher got this information that I found, but they had names like one sheep you might call long ears, another sheep you might call white nose or whatever. But even cooler than that, as, as Jesus says here, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. They respond to it. I know a shepherd not too far from here. And I know his son goes out there and he calls the sheep and they come in. Of course, they're probably ready to eat. So three things here. The sheep hear his voice. He calls them by name and he leads them. Another fun fact. I didn't know this, but Middle Eastern shepherds don't follow their sheep. They lead them. And they use dogs. I wonder if they had German shepherds back then. Because this guy I know who has sheep, he's got a German shepherd that he's trained to kind of drive those sheep where they need to be. So who knows what kind of dog. But they knew his voice, so they followed him. And Jesus contrasts that by using a stranger. What if a stranger came around? This guy who tried to climb over the wall. The sheep aren't going to answer to his voice. They don't recognize it. They're dumb animals, but they know enough to recognize their voice. And they won't go with him. They know each other. Verses 14 and 15. This, this word know doesn't mean I know of your existence. It means there's an intimate, personal relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Now we're in a spiritual metaphor. This is an intimate relationship between our shepherd, Jesus Christ, and us. There's a lot of parallels that come in here. The relationship between the father and the son illustrates the same relationship that he has for us. And if you take it just a little bit further, it should be the close, intimate, personal relationship between your shepherd and you. You see, all true pastoral work is through personal acquaintance. Right? During the worst of COVID... I pastored you guys through the phone and social media. I tried calling everybody regularly, the ones I had phone numbers for. It wasn't adequate, but it was better than nothing. I know most of you want to just, I'd call you just out of the blue, and you were just so excited that I had called. Just want to see how you're doing. Did you need anything? The deacons were doing the same thing. It's the only way we could pastor because we were closed down. But once we opened up, it was great to be back in person, even if we were forced to wear a mask. At least we were with each other. Got to see you face to face, at least when you took your mask off. You see, folks, we, the body of Christ, the Christians that are in this room right now and those who are not with us, we were made to be social. You know, someone say we're social animals. We were commanded to gather together here at our scheduled meetings. Do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Live streaming sermons. I guess the camera's on, right? Okay. Got to behave myself. Not, not. Live streaming sermons is a wonderful thing. But some people have used it as an excuse to lay out a church. We cannot minister to one another in the most effective ways unless we are in the physical presence of each other. You know what I love to do before Sunday school or before church or whatever event we're having? I like to watch you guys. You socialize. You love to sit around and talk and drink coffee and, and reminisce. And Isn't that wonderful? It's great. You need that. Some of you live alone. And it's very important for you to have that social interaction. Not just because human beings are that way, but because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are my brother or sister. And what do families do? They hang out together. They do things together. Just ask Ralph and Dean. They had probably 500 people come to their house over the course of the summer. I don't know. It's, I'm not criticizing. It's great. <laughs> 
Because y'all's family is prolific. <laughs> but that's a good thing. They're blessed, yes. Our son will be here next Sunday. I mean, he's driving in on Sunday, so he won't be at church. But we can't wait. Have him around. He's going to do his Christmas Eve service, by the way, that he did last year. You need to be here for that. Because I was impressed. Of course, I'm easily impressed. Second thing I want to pull out of this, leaders lead, y'all. Leaders lead. No pastor or deacon should ever take the job for the wrong reasons. And I didn't look at you for any particular reason, Ralph. It's the way my head turned. This is a calling from God, and it must be carefully evaluated. Also, leadership, as we defined it, is an art. Which means you sometimes have to be patient with your shepherds because they're learning to lead sometimes. Pastors or deacons who turn out wrong for the job ought to be replaced. One other thing about leading, we leaders must never lose sight of the common goal to know Christ and to make him known through worship, love, and service. When a military unit is given a mission, it must accomplish that mission or, or do its absolute best. And the leader of that military unit has got to focus on that and make sure he's got everything together to get the job done. Logistics, personnel, all of that. Another thing about this is spiritual discernment. Sheep who follow the good shepherd are not led astray, but however, we constantly are bombarded with other voices. We have more sources of information today than any other time in history. I was talking to somebody the, the other day and said, you know, back during the Revolutionary War, the only source of news that was available was a newspaper and word of mouth. They didn't have anything else. And they fought a war and defeated the most powerful nation on the planet at the time. We have so many voices. How do we determine which ones are true and worth us considering or lying voices that are trying to lead us astray? I'm going to tell you this, if it's on social media, you can assume it's false. That's my default position. If I'm on there, I'm just looking for funny memes, man, to get a laugh. But all the rest of that stuff's garbage. How do you know who to trust for your news? I can tell you personally afterwards who I use, but how do you determine if what that talking head is saying is true or not? Well, you've got to be active, and you've got to research things. There are ways to find the truth. First of all, pray for discernment. In your daily prayers, please make that a regular request. Lord, please give me discernment, the skill to determine truth from falsity. Then we must educate ourselves in God's Word. God's Word teaches us truth. And it warns us of lies. The next time you look at a TV preacher, which I wish you'd just stay away from, but that's your choice. Or you find a book by a, quote, Christian author that you want to read. Sift it through the lens of Scripture. Listen to that still, small voice that's telling you, there's something wrong with what this Yahoo's saying on this channel. If you can't put your finger on it exactly, what isn't just right, then it probably isn't. Learn to think critically. Don't take anyone's word on, on important matters. Go after it yourself. We need to be smarter, Christians. We need to be smarter in God's word, but we also need to be smarter about this. Thing you hear and read because we are overwhelmed with stuff.
Now I want to tell you something else about how the sheep and the shepherd communicate. This is a cool story. It's short, kind of. Arab shepherds are well known for knowing their sheep personally. During the Palestinian uprising in the late 1980s, the Israeli army decided to punish a village near Bethlehem for not paying its taxes. The officer in command rounded up all of the village animals and placed them in a large barbed wire pen. Later in the week, he was approached by a woman who begged him to release her flock, arguing that since her husband was dead, the animals were her only source of livelihood. He pointed to the pen containing hundreds of animals and humorously quipped that it was impossible because he could not find her animals. She asked that if she could in fact separate them herself, would he be willing to let her take them? He agreed. So a soldier opened the gate, and the woman's son produced a small flute. He played a simple tune again and again, and soon sheep heads began popping up across the pen. The young boy continued his music and walked home, followed by his flock of 25 sheep. Those sheep knew their shepherd. Do you know your shepherd? Isn't it a comfort that Jesus knows us? You know, he knows us by name. And if we're his, we know him. It just blows me away that us puny human beings could know the creator of the universe. That's only true for those who come to faith in Christ. So last thing is, it's only through Jesus that salvation and freedom can be found. But he talks about it in verse 6. These Pharisees are blinded by their pride. They cannot understand. They are unable to understand that Jesus, Jesus classifies them as the thieves and robbers. The gate metaphor, when Jesus talks about going through the gate, or him being the gate, that is the one way to salvation that we talk about all the time. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And he is the gate. And once you enter the gate, become part of the flock, he is your shepherd. It's a beautiful metaphor. He's talking about the religious establishment of the day. He's telling them they're false shepherds, but they're just not getting it. In verse 9, Jesus talks about the safety, the eternal life, and the nourishment that we have when we come to Christ. You see, these guys are life-denying, but Jesus is life-affirming, both physically and spiritually. The word abundantly means to the full. We can live our lives to the full once we become a submissive member of the flock and have him as our shepherd. When he talks about the good shepherd, verse 11, Good, in this case, can be translated beautiful or excellent. So he's basically saying he's the great, he's the chief shepherd, which we, of course, don't argue with. He lays down his life for the sheep. You remember in the Old Testament, David told Saul that he had killed many lions and bears protecting his, his flock. So apparently they had a lot, of, a, a lot more types of wildlife in Palestine back in those days than they do now. They lions, bears, wolves. And so when he talks in verse 16, this is interesting. This, is, this verse has created a lot of controversy. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one flock, one flock, one shepherd. What he's talking about here, remember, he is talking to Jews. His audience is the Jewish people including many of their leaders. Gentiles were any, was anybody that wasn't a Jew. And they were looked down upon. The Jews were very haughty and very arrogant about their identity in, Christ, in God. And anybody that wasn't with them was less than acceptable. Jesus was saying here, as we find out after his ascension to heaven in the book of Acts, that God has decided the Gentiles need to be included in this plan of salvation. You know what that means? Every one of us. I don't believe any of you are Jewish. 
Of course, if we did a DNA test, there might be some way back. You're the Gentiles. We're the Gentiles. And Jesus included us in this plan of salvation. In verse 18, he talks about laying down his life, taking it up again. He's talking about his crucifixion and his death and his resurrection. And he says, I have the authority. Don't, you know, there's a misconception in the church that Jesus was a helpless victim of the Romans and the Jews. He was not. This verse says he willingly laid his life down. You know, his, his sacrifice for our sins wouldn't be any good if he was forced to do it. He willingly did this. It's all part of the plan. He had the authority to lay his life down. And he had the authority to raise it up again, which he did both. Now, these Pharisees were false teachers. But there's false teachers, religions, and cults all around us. The world's religions offer all kinds of paths to some sort of heaven. There is a lie from the pit of hell that says that all religions lead to the same God. Christianity is persecuted for one big reason, our exclusivity. We claim that our Savior is the only way to eternal life with the Father. We claim it not because we just believe it. We claim it because this book tells us it's the truth. This means by the powers of very simple deduction that no other religion is correct. No other religion, those other religions can maybe produce good results in some areas and ways, can produce pious people, maybe good, honest, holy people. But if it's not through Christ, don't get mad at me, get mad at the Lord. This is his plan. This is the only path through Christ. And then, you know, not just religions, but there's things in this world that offer paths to happiness, fulfillment, enlightenment, pleasure, riches, and on and on. We, we're always looking for the next greatest thing that will make us happy. Look at advertising. I love it that I can record what I want to watch on TV and fast forward through the commercials. Because the big message they're throwing at you right now, especially at Christmas time, is you cannot possibly have a happy holidays unless you get rid of that old car you got and go buy a brand new one. I'm not wrong. And it, everything else that they're, they're pandering out there is all tied that they have corrupted the season that is celebrating the birth of the Savior of the world, and most people don't even believe in him. You know what I call out? I call out hypocrites. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ and you celebrate Christmas in any way, shape, or form, you are a hypocrite. If I went to Mecca and pretended to be a Muslim and walking around that big, whatever that, I can't remember what it's called, and they're praying to Allah and all of this other stuff, and someone found out I wasn't really a Christian, the Kaaba, thank you. They'd probably kill me. <laughs> We're always looking for something. But here's the problem. Nothing in this world can bring joy. You know why? Because joy is a deep-seated, long-lasting state of elation that can't be shaken. That's joy. It only comes from one who created life and gave it a purpose, and that's Jesus. Things of the world can make you happy temporarily. But that pork loin I'm going to eat this afternoon, that's going to make me happy. Had, had to do it right. But you know, just as soon as I finished eating it, I'll be satisfied, but I don't know about happy. Jesus brings us joy. When we focus on him, and focus on growing your relationship with him. Especially, hear me, in these difficult days we're in. When we could be getting to the, to the end. To Christ's return. Now I don't know, I'm not ever going to say I know when Christ is coming back. As soon as I do say that, you need to fire me, Ralph. Because nobody knows. But there's things going on in this world right now. That, I mean, you can, the oldest person in this room would probably agree they've never seen anything like this. 
They'd never seen the violence and the hatred, the division. And now our country faces a potential invasion of Ukraine by Russia and an invasion of Taiwan by China. If I was a betting man, I'd throw a pretty good-sized bet down on the table that they're cooperating with each other and they're going to go at the same time. What will that do to us? I don't know. I say, come Lord Jesus. One other point from this, this last point. He talks about other sheep. In their context, they're talking about people on the margins. You know, neglected people. People that, pe that others don't pay attention to. They were marginalized, you might say. But Jesus offers salvation to all people, tribes, and nations. The church should be populated by anybody who wants to respond to Christ. And ideally, we ought to reflect our local population. Well, where are the Native Americans in here? Why don't they come? We welcome everybody. I don't care who you are. Because Jesus had this message for all of us. In Isaiah 40, the prophet speaks God's message to his people. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. Remember, he's coming back. And his arm rules for him. That speaks of God's power. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense, which is another word for reward, is before him. He's talking about Christ coming back and us who are still alive at the time having our reward. And then look, 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 look what he's going to do with us. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will gather them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. What a beautiful picture of God welcoming us into his presence. The 23rd Psalm, we all know it. It starts off like this, the Lord is my shepherd. Then what does it say? I shall not want. I have everything I need because he's my shepherd. Everything. All we need is Jesus. The people who heard Jesus speak of the sheep, the sheep pen and its gate, and the shepherd, they perfectly understood these things. They were an agrarian society. They raised sheep. It was a key part of their economy. From sheep, they got wool, milk, and meat, not to mention the important use of sheep as sacrifices in their religious system. Sheep pens, I told you, were walled enclosures where sheep were kept at night, protecting them from wild animals and, and bandits. They even put briars stacked up on top of the walls so anybody that tried to crawl over the wall gets stuck. It was early concertina wire. <laughs> okay. um, but shepherds had a tough job. Not only would they lead the sheep to water and good grazing land, which was hard to find at certain times of the year in the Middle East, but the shepherds had to protect them. He was tough and courageous. He carried a staff which served as a weapon. And he knew how to use it. <laughs> then he had a slingshot, which he was good with. Since the sheep was his livelihood, the shepherd was willing to risk his, risk his life because it affected his family's well-being. The shepherd loved his sheep. told you even he gave him names to his favorites carried a pipe around so he'd have a, or a song that he'd sing which would call the sheep to him sheep being prone to wander and not too bright at least they knew the shepherd's voice or his tune or the song they would not respond to any other shepherd's calling my point our world is a moral desert just like the Judean desert it's full of danger, temptations, and evil. A sheep alone in that Judean desert environment wouldn't last the night. 
You and I can't make it through this immoral culture without our shepherd, Jesus. We can't make it without being affected by it. He stands as a capable and courageous, protective shepherd. And he repels the enemy who seeks to kill and destroy. When he, we wander even, he has a special word for us to bring us back. Most beautiful of all in this metaphor is he knows us and we know him. If you are truly in Christ, he knows you by name. He maybe even has a special name for you like the shepherds here. Um, the Bible says he delights in us and he sings about us. Think about that. And all the while, he's protecting us and providing for us. I love the fact that the Greek word translated good can mean beautiful or excellent because this describes our great shepherd who knows us intimately. Thank him for the little things. Be grateful. We know his voice. Whenever we read his word, which I hope you all do regularly, or hear it preached or taught, we know that it's the true word from God. There's no doubt. If our preacher has faithfully fulfilled his duty to properly submit to the Holy Spirit and exposit God's word, then we are indeed hearing from the Lord. And we know it because we know him. When God's Spirit speaks to us, we know it's Him. For those not in the flock, Jesus does not know them in the same sense as He knows His own. Neither can they know Him or His voice unless the Father draws them to Himself. This is why the Pharisees couldn't understand Jesus. They weren't in His flock. Though we do know that eventually many of the Pharisees and priests did come to Christ later on. So if you're here and you're listening online maybe, and you're tired of shepherding yourself. By the way, how's that been going for you? Why don't you come to the Good Shepherd today? By placing your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, Turn from your sins and follow him. You will become a protected member of the flock. His flock. Doesn't mean hard times won't come, but it does mean those hard times will have a purpose. The Bible promises Jesus is going to return one day. He's going to rescue his flock and punish the rebellious. All tears, pain, and suffering will be over. And the members of the flock will live with him for eternity. You know, let me share a quote from a Bible scholar. I'll just let it sit in your head for a minute. Talking about how things are in the world right now and Jesus' return and so on. Can a nation or a city become so utterly godless so utterly pagan and thoroughgoing in its repudiation of the gospel that it experiences a curtailment of God's activity? I believe the answer to that is yes. When a people, a city, a country goes so far, I think that it is realistic to expect that God may draw back and say, okay, read Romans chapter 1. That's the way you want to be. I'm going to let you live that way, but you're going to have to reap the consequences in this life and the next. Last paragraph, promise. This is for the Christian who has drifted away from his faith. Talking to the people online. You are in rebellion and disobedience. No bones about it. You must repent. And return to your shepherd. He has grace aplenty for even the most backslidden Christian, and I know this to be true. Rejoin your brothers and sisters in Christ. Come back to church. 
and once again be under the good shepherd's provision and protection. There will be no judgment from us. Just come back. Ready for the final song? I'm out of words and breath. <clears throat>